wife and I did at Revelation Now in Havana, Cuba, one of the first Protestant teams to preach the gospel in Cuba. And every morning we would go to take our morning walk, get a little exercise, and it wasn't long until I noticed that almost every single person walked along the sidewalk with their heads down. Rarely would someone be looking up. Every once in a while, we'd see someone looking up. When we did, I saw what I call hollow eyes, emptiness, nothingness, despair, because they had no hope for anything better. And you know, the disturbing thing about that to me is that I'm beginning to see those hollow eyes right in our own country. People living without hope. Just this morning, I saw in the news, the economy loses 85,000 more jobs as the economists were disappointed, expecting it to show growth. The sharp drop in the workforce, 661,000 fewer people showed that more of the jobless are giving up. You see, the 10% unemployment only shows those who are trying to find a job. Once you give up and quit trying to find a job, you don't count anymore. It should be 17% instead of 10. But people are giving up, giving up because they have no hope. Fear striking the hearts of men and women. Just last October, Gordon Brown of the United Kingdom said, he warned that the UK faces a catastrophe of floods, droughts, and killer heat waves if the world fails to agree on a deal on climate change. Negotiators have 50 days to save the world from global warming. They are afraid. Men and women are afraid. Afraid of climate change, afraid of global warming, afraid of the economy, afraid of homelessness, afraid of losing jobs, afraid of swine's flu. I remember one of my neighbors he happens to be the editor of the local newspaper. After Katrina, after tsunami, after Katrina, after almost every disaster, he says, Jack, what's going on? Does the Bible have anything to say about this? It's scary. And I said, the Bible does have something to say. You need to come to Revelation now. Scary? The disciples asked Jesus, what, what are the signs? How are we going to know when the end comes? And Jesus said in Luke, the 21st chapter, he said, you'll see these signs, verse 10, nation will rise up against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be earthquakes and famine and pestilence in various places and fearful events and great signs from the heavens. Matthew said these are just the beginning of birth pains. There will be signs in the sun, the moon, the stars, the earth, the nations will be in anguish, perplexity at the roaring and the tossing of the sea. Sounds like tsunamis, sounds like hurricanes, sounds like Katrina's. Men will faint from terror, apprehensive of what is coming on the world, for even the heavenly bodies will be shaken. Jesus said there will be disaster after disaster, war after war, nations after nations. The Bible is telling us that we should expect something terribly wrong with our planet and look around. 
You're seeing it. Now, a lot of these things have been going on for a lot of times, and that doesn't mean that these are proof that Jesus is coming right now. He said it's like birth pains coming on to a pregnant woman. Birth pains take time, and every one is a reminder that, yes, it hurts now, but it's going to get better later. And every one getting closer and closer and more and more intense reminds us that we're getting closer and closer to the end. It is going to be bad. Bad things are going to happen, Jesus said. But there's hope. And that brings us to the last book of the Bible. In fact, the last chapter of the last book, in Revelation chapter 22, Jesus says three times, with steadfast firmness, he says, Behold, verse 7, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of this book. Verse 12, Behold, I am coming soon, Jesus said. Verse 20, He who testifies to these things says, Yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The bad news is that things are getting worse and worse and worse. The good news is that Jesus is coming soon. Amen. He is coming soon, and more and more people are becoming aware of the fact that Jesus is coming soon. Millions of people are beginning to turn to faith in Jesus. But I know also the Bible says in the last days there will be scoffers. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3, first of all, you must understand, in the last days, scoffers will come scoffing and following their own evil desires. They'll say, where is this coming that you have promised? Where is this coming? Jesus hasn't come yet. Church, you've been saying for 2,000 years, Jesus is coming soon. Not here yet. I don't see him. The astronaut Yuri Gagarin years ago, flying up in space, looked out of his capsule and said, I didn't see God out there. Where is this coming? There are skeptics, maybe even right here in your own town. If there are any skeptics, I hope you're here because i got good news for you. Jesus is coming again. And you can know that. You can know without a doubt that we are living in the end times, that this is the Word of God, and that Jesus is coming soon. But you know, sometimes we do things... I don't want you to get the wrong idea. I don't make it a habit of buying these. I call them the grocery store scandal sheets. I didn't buy this one. My wife did. <laughs> she bought it because she knew I would want it, though. So, <laughs> Several years, 10 years ago, over 10 years ago now, July 20, 1999, the world will end in the year 2000, warn Bible scholars. Did you hear about that? Sure you did. All over the place leading up to 2009. The, look at the headlines here. Caution to readers. The messages published inside warn about the end of the world, and they may be terrifying to some people. Be careful when sharing it with others. So I'm trying to be careful. If you don't want to hear this, plug up your ears. The world will end in the year 2000, warn Bible scholars. Look at that. Twelve of them. Twelve top clergymen tell why the world must end by the year 2000. No wonder my wife bought this for me. And I began to read through this. Reverend Roger Clerpool, chairman of the Anglican Institute for Bible Study. He should know. Careful reading of the book of Revelation makes it clear that doomsday will occur at the end of the second millennium, the year 2000. Here's another one. Father Vincent Donatello, librarian at the Vatican. Surely he should know. The book of Revelation indicates the world will end in the year 2000. Twelve scholars, Dr. Hamid Saeed, Islamic minister, Professor Joan Merchant of Tulsa, Oklahoma, Rabbi Herzl Rosenblum, author of Interpreting the Dead Sea Scrolls, a Jewish scholar, says the world will end in the year 2000. But here's my favorite one. My favorite one, Professor Hong Trang Hua, Buddhist monk, and special envoy of the Dalai Lama in Hanoi, Vietnam. 
The Dalai Lama has told me that the world will end by the year 2000. But someone asked him, what should we do to be prepared? And the word from the Dalai Lama through Professor Hong Trang Hua, you're going to like this. Accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. Even if Jesus was not really God, there's no harm in hedging your bets. <laughs> Folks, you don't have to hedge your bets. Jesus is God. This is his word. I'm going to prove it to you. But how can 12 Bible scholars get it so wrong? How can they get it so wrong? They made two mistakes. First of all, Jesus said, no man knows the time when he's going to come. So I don't care if they are a PhD or a, any kind of diddly bop at all behind their names. If they say that the Bible teaches the world will end by the year 2000 or 2010 or 2020 or whenever, they are wrong because no man knows. But the second reason is that many people don't understand. Revelation is not like any other book. But Revelation is written in code. And you have to know how to crack the code. But the problem is that so many people are trying so many different methods of cracking the code when the answer to the code is found in the book itself. I'm going to show you nine keys to understanding Revelation. It begins with these very words that give us the most important secret. It begins with the words, the revelation of Jesus Christ. So that tells me that the book of Revelation reveals Jesus Christ. He is the center of the book. The hero of the book of Revelation is not the beast, it's the lamb. Everybody wants to know about the beast. Everybody wants to know about the mark and the 666 and the false prophet and Armageddon. Everybody wants to know about these things. But it won't do you any good to know about the beast and the mark and Armageddon if you don't know the Lamb. Amen. The book of Revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. And you need to know him first. So all of the prophecies must center through and pass through Jesus Christ if you want to get them right. And then the second key to understanding Revelation, and this one is almost always overlooked. But I have a, a scholar friend in the seminaries, written a lot of books on Revelation, has studied it for 35 years, and he has found that the book of Revelation, the last book in the Bible, quotes, refers to, or alludes to the Old Testament over 600 times. Over 600 times. In fact, a friend in Australia just published a new Bible where he highlights all of the references in Revelation to the Old Testament. He claims there are over 900 allusions or references to the Old Testament. Now, I don't know about that. Haven't had time to check them all out yet, but I'm, I'm sure about 600 600 times. Now, for those of you that are not too up to speed on the Bible, the Bible has two main sections, the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament consists of 39 books that were written before Jesus came. The New Testament consists of 27 books that were written after Jesus came. That's the difference between the two. 66 books, 37 of them in the Old Testament. The book of Revelation quotes those Old Testament texts over 600 times. So here's the key. You have to have a foundation in the Old Testament if you're ever going to understand the book of Revelation. 
Every three verses in Revelation quotes or alludes to the Old Testament at least two times. So you have to know something about the Old Testament. And then the third key. No private interpretation allowed. All of the interpretations you read from the Enquirer were private interpretations. The only kind of interpretation I'm interested in is the one that God intended for us to get. Well, how can you be sure that you're doing it? By letting the Bible interpret itself. Well, how do you let the Bible interpret itself? It's easy. Just compare Scripture with Scripture. Line up all the Bible verses that talk about the topic that you're studying, and you watch. They all point in one direction, and that is to Jesus Christ. So let's put these principles together and start using them. I'm going to start with one of the most difficult themes in the book of Revelation. Just a little hors d'oeuvre, just a little introduction. Revelation chapter 16. In Revelation 16... The Bible says, verse 19, the great city split into three parts. The cities of the nations collapsed, and God remembered Babylon the great and gave her the cup filled with the wine of the fury of his wrath. Now, God is not happy with Babylon for some reason. Why? And what is the meaning of Babylon and the fall of Babylon? What does it care about us? Why do we care? These are questions that you're going to understand as we dig into Revelation now. Remember the book of Revelation quotes or alludes to the Old Testament over how many times? Over 600 times. So that's one of the places. Let's go. One of my favorite spots that talks about the fall of Babylon. Daniel. The book of Daniel. So turn there to Daniel chapter 1. In the first chapter you're going to discover Daniel and Revelation go together like a hand fitting into a glove. Daniel chapter 1, first chapter, first verse. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, that's God's people, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. The Lord delivered, now notice God is doing something here, the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, into his hand along with some of the articles from the temple of God and he took these articles, golden cups, he took them back to Babylon and put them in the treasure house of his God. So what's happening? This wicked, pagan, wild king, Nebuchadnezzar, who had nothing to do with God, sent his armies to Jerusalem. They captured the city, but even worse than that, they captured the people, and even worse, they captured the temple of God and went into the temple and took some cups that God had said were holy and brought them back to Babylon and put them in the Babylonian temple and used them to drink to the Babylonian gods. That was the ultimate insult in your face attack to the power of the Most High God. And the people believed in those days that when one nation came in and attacked another nation and defeated it, that was the proof that that nation's God was stronger than the other God. So picture in your mind God's people, the people of the Almighty God, captive, walking the burning hot desert sands to Babylon, leaving their homes in rubbles, leaving everything behind, prisoners in Babylon. What do you think they are thinking as they walk through the desert? I'll tell you what they were thinking. They're thinking, where is God? Where is God? People are wondering that today. We did a revelation now in the Soviet Union on the eastern edge, and a lady came up to me and said, you know, about 50 years ago, the German armies came in through here and they took my son. He was only 18 years old. They made him join the army and march to fight against Russia. 
And I've been praying for my son for eight, for 50 years now, and your God has never answered. Tell me, where is God? Cuba, the folks that we were staying with in their homes, said we have been praying for 40 years that God would deliver us from this horrible dictator. Where is God? You ever wondered? Where is God? Cancer strikes. Planes crash into the Twin Towers. Where was God? He could have prevented that, couldn't he? Where was God when it happened? It seems like no time when the twinkle in a bride's eye turns to tears in a divorce court. Where is God? A baby dies before he has time to take his first breath. Where? You ever wondered, where is God today? Unemployment soars. Foreclosures soar. People are losing their jobs, losing their homes, losing their family, destitute, hungry, and homeless. Where is God? That's what they were wondering as they wandered through the desert sands, captive, but there's always a little glimmer of hope in the darkness when you study God's Word. God is a God who can turn defeat into victory. Did you know that? And there were four young men, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, that were among those taken captive. The king saw something in them. God impressed him to see something in them. And verse 5 tells us that they were to be trained for three years and enter the king's service. The king assigned them daily amounts of food and wine from the king's table. So these four young men, a ray of lightness coming into the darkness, they were selected to be trained to serve in the king's court. But the problem was they had to eat at his table, and there were things on the table that God had asked them not to eat and not to drink. What would you do if you were the guest of a king and you sat at his table and he says, eat, and there were things there that God said not to eat, and he says, drink, and there were things there that God said not to drink. What would you do if you were there? Well, Daniel, the Bible tells us, purposed in his heart to stay faithful to God in verse 8. He trusted God. And so he said in verse 10, we don't want to eat some of those things at the table. Can you give us permission not to eat that? And the God says, well, no, he says, I'm afraid of my Lord the King who has assigned your food and drink. Why, he would see you looking worse than the other men your age, and because of that, he'd have my head because of you. Eat it. Now what are they going to do? You know, there's something really neat happening in verse 9. God calls the official to show favor and sympathy to Daniel. You see, God isn't just a God up there and we're down here, but God interacts. He intervenes in our lives. He can set things up for us just like he did for Daniel. I'm going to show you how he does that. And so Daniel, emboldened, said in verse 12, Test us for ten days. Give us nothing but, but vegetables to eat and water to drink. And see, ten days. And he said, okay, ten days. Verse 15, at the end of the ten days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the king's food. Now, I want to tell you, God's way is always the best way. Amen? God's way is best. When God says something, you can trust him. Daniel trusted him. You can trust him. God's way is the best. No matter what you see on TV, except Revelation now, no matter what you read in the newspaper, no matter what anybody tells you, God's way is the best way. It was wiser than the rest of the men. Verse 17, to these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding. You see, God will do things for us. Verse 18, at the end of that time set by the king, they were to appear before him, final exam time, 
And in every matter, verse 20, every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better than all of the magicians, wise men, enchanters in his kingdom. Would you like to be ten times wiser than the wisest people on earth? You can be. If you too, like Dan, your purpose in your heart to trust God. Now, in chapter 2, we're going to look at some of the wisdom that would be good for the world leaders today to understand. I call it God's roadmap to help us navigate through the confusion and the morass that we see around us today. Daniel, the second chapter. Verse 1, in the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. His mind was troubled. So he called his magicians, his wise men, his astrologers, tell me what my dream was and interpret it for me. So they got their crystal balls out. They plotted, they got their charts of the stars and they got their tarot cards and whatever else they wanted to bring out to the table and they pondered over them, but they couldn't come up with a dream. So they finally went to the king. Tell us what the dream is and we'll tell you the interpretation. Oh, I know you guys. If I tell you the dream, you'll make up an interpretation and I won't know that it's true. So tell me the dream and then I'll know that the interpretation is true. If not, I'll just cut you up in little pieces. How'd you like to live in a place like that? Well, they couldn't tell him, even though they boasted that they would be able to do all these things. They couldn't do it king ordered them to be all chopped up into pieces and finally Daniel said make an appointment with the king for me now Daniel did not know the dream when he did that he didn't know the dream but Daniel knew God make an appointment for me so he made an appointment and then the Bible tells us Daniel went home and prayed I believe that he and his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, they prayed together. Just listen to a little piece of this prayer, verse 20. Praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. He changes times and seasons. He sets up kings and deposes them. He gives wisdom to the wise, knowledge to the discerning. He reveals deep and hidden things. Praise be to the name of God. God knows everything, and all power is His. God can do anything. And He doesn't ask you to accept it blindly. But in Daniel chapter 2 is ample proof for anyone who really wants the answer to that question. He gives wisdom to the wise, knowledge to the discerning. He reveals deep and hidden secrets. I'm going to show you how to tap in to that power, to probe into those deep and hidden secrets, to experience it in your own life. And those of you that are watching on TV, be sure you check the television record, see when we're on again next time, put a circle around that day. You're not going to want to miss it. So he goes in to the king, and the king asked him, Tell me the dream. Are you able? And Daniel replied in verse 27, No wise man, magician, enchanter, or diviner can explain to the king the mystery that he has asked about. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and he has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in the days to come. No man can tell you, O king, but there is a God in heaven, and he can tell you. He didn't go in there and say, Oh, I'm so much smarter than these magicians. He gave all the glory to God. And then he began to tell him the dream. Now, I want you to watch this. Just picture in your mind what Nebuchadnezzar saw. Verse 31, You looked, O king, and there before you was a large statue 
dazzling, awesome in appearance. Can you see it? A big, tall statue, awesome in appearance. Verse 32, the head of the statue was made of pure gold. Look at it, big statue, pure gold head, shining in the sun. Get it in focus. The head of your statue, pure gold, its chest and arms were silver, flashing in the sun. Belly and thighs were bronze, the legs of iron, its feet were partly iron and partly clay. And while you were watching, watching that image a rock was cut out but not by human hands and that rock struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and it smashed them and the iron the clay the bronze the silver and the gold were broken to pieces at the same time and they became like chaff on a threshing floor in the summer the wind swept them away without leaving a trace but the rock the rock that smashed the image that rock became a huge mountain that filled the whole earth. That's it, Nebuchadnezzar says. That's exactly what I saw. Now tell me what it means. Did you see it? A big image, a head of gold, a breast and arms of silver, a body and thighs of bronze, legs of iron, feet of iron and clay, and the big rock comes, and it smashes that image, all the nations, and it becomes big enough to fill the whole earth. That's what I saw. Now, what does it mean? And Daniel gives him the interpretation. Look at it with me, verse 36. This is the dream. Now we will interpret it to the king. You, O king, are the king of kings. The God of heaven has given you dominion and might and power. You are the head of gold. Whoa, Nebuchadnezzar liked that interpretation. Well, his chest was sticking out, his buttons popping off. I'm the head of gold. He represented his kingdom, Babylon. And he was the head of gold, the king over all the kings. And Babylon did rule. Practically the entire civilized world at that time. Nebuchadnezzar liked that interpretation. 605 B.C., Babylon captured God's people, and that established him over the, even the people of God. But he didn't like what came next verse 39 after you another kingdom will rise inferior to yours next the third kingdom one of bronze will rule over the whole earth finally there'll be a fourth kingdom as strong as iron so the head of gold the breast and arms of silver the body and torso of bronze the legs of iron they all represent kingdoms that will dominate and rule over God's people and over the earth well, we know the head of gold symbolized Babylon so who's next I could tell you who's next, but you see, that would be my interpretation. Remember, we need to let the Bible interpret itself, and we compare Scripture with Scripture. And so hold your place in Daniel 2, and let's find out who's next, who is symbolized by that breast and arms of silver. And we go to the fifth chapter of Daniel. At the end of Daniel chapter 5, verse 30, that night, Belshazzar. Now Nebuchadnezzar by now had died. His son Belshazzar was the king. Belshazzar, king of the Babylonians, was slain and Darius the Mede took over the kingdom at the age of 62. So the Bible tells us that Babylon was overthrown by Media and Media joined together with Persia was the Medo-Persian Empire. And that's exactly the way it happened. History confirms in the year 538 B.C., Medo-Persia overthrew the Babylonian Empire and ruled over God's people just the way God said it would happen. Well, then, what is symbolized by the torso, the body of bronze and the thighs of bronze, the third kingdom? Who is that? I could tell you. But we're not interested in my interpretation. We want God's interpretation. So let's apply the principle again. Compare Scripture with Scripture. Daniel chapter 8. And there it is. In chapter 8, verse 4, a ram charging to the west. Verse 5, a goat with a big horn between his eyes came from the west. And he charged towards that ram and trampled the ram under his feet. And then the goat, verse 8, became very great. But at the height of his power, that large horn was broken off. 
And in its place, four prominent horns grew up towards the four winds of heaven. So now we see this goat symbolizing the third kingdom trampling the Medes and the Persians underfoot. Who is that goat? Well, the Bible tells us. Verse 20, the two-horned ram that you saw represents the kings of Media and Persia, the shaggy goat, the king of Greece. And so now the third kingdom is Greece and the large horn between his eyes is the first king. You know, everyone knows the first king of Greece was Alexander the Great, the big horn between his eyes. But it was broken off at the peak of its power. 32 years old, Alexander conquered all that he could conquer. Nothing more to do. Turned to alcohol, died in a drunken stupor at the peak of his power. The horn broke off exactly the way the Bible said it would happen. Hundreds of years in advance. Advance. God knows the future. God reveals the future. And here's the proof. That horn was broken off. Four little horns came up in its place, dividing the kingdom of Greece among his four generals, Cassander, Lysimachus, Seleucus, and Ptolemy, just the way it said would happen. Now Greece is weakened and weakened Greece paves the way for that fourth kingdom, the iron legs. As every schoolchild knows, the iron monarchy of Rome. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, rising and falling just exactly the way the Bible said it was going to happen. By 169 B.C., Rome rose to power dominating over God's people and ruling practically the entire civilized world. But it's not over yet. There's more in the prophecy. Verse 41, just as you saw the feet and the toes were partly baked clay and partly iron, so this will be a divided kingdom. In verse 42, as the toes were partly iron and partly clay. So here is a divided kingdom, divided into the ten toes. And we know, history confirms, the massive barbarian invasions dividing the mighty Roman Empire into the nations that today have become Europe. The Vandals, the Ostrogoths, the Heruli, the Alemanni, the Anglo-Saxons, the Burgundians, the Suvi, the Visigoths, the Franks swarmed over the empire. Three of those, the Vandals, the Ostrogoths, and the Heruli were, were uprooted and taken out of the way. But the others, the Anglo-Saxons settled in England and, and the Goths in Spain, forming the modern nations of Europe as we know it today. Hundreds of years in advance, God said there would be Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, and Rome would be divided. And precisely the way God said it would happen, it did. You can trust the Bible. You can trust God's Word. It's true. And some say, well, how do we know it was written hundreds of years? And it, Hold on. I'm coming to that. Because the prophecy isn't over yet. There's still more. Look, verse 43. Just as you saw the iron mixed with baked clay, so the people will be a mixture, but they will not remain united. Now, I like the way the King James Version says it there. It says they will not cleave one into another. They will mix, they will mingle, but they won't stick together. Up until that time, there was Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. 169, Rome rose to power. And then by the year 496 A.D., the massive barbarian invasions were complete. Rome was divided, and God said, no more, never again, no single nation will ever dominate and rule over the earth. They will not cleave one unto another. Many world leaders tried to weld those toes back together again and to form a united Europe and many world leaders failed. Men like Charlemagne, Louis XIV, Charles V. Charles V, mighty warrior, rode on the battlefield till he was 70 years old, had nine horses killed from underneath him while he was fighting. And his goal was to build the United Europe, and it looked as though he was going to succeed. But then, finally, towards the end of his reign, revolutions broke out all over his empire. He was finally forced to abrogate his throne. He gave to his son, Philip II, 
the Central Europe and his brother Ferdinand, all of the rest, and Charles V, the mighty warrior, retired to a lonely castle, no doubt tormented by the words, they shall not cleave one unto another. And no man can ever change one word that comes from the word of God. Amen. Napoleon. They called him the little giant. Little because he was only five feet two. Giant because he was a military genius. He put together a military that began to, to pulverize the surrounding nations of France. His goal was to build the United Europe. And it looked as though nothing was going to stop Napoleon. In fact, when he was in prison, Napoleon said, I wanted to found a European system, a European court of law, a European court of appeals. There would be one people throughout all Europe. Europe would soon have become one nation. But Napoleon met Lord Wellington at Waterloo, and there in the form of torrential rainstorms, Napoleon met his Waterloo and was defeated. But I want to suggest to you tonight that it was not Lord Wellington who defeated Napoleon. Look Magazine put together a team of researchers, and they studied that battle at Waterloo. They got all the information they could get, put it into a computer with some new software, and finally when they had all of that information together, they clicked the mouse. Chook! And the computer said, Napoleon cannot lose. But the computer couldn't see God standing with one foot in France and one foot on the continent of Europe saying, they shall not cleave one unto another. And no man, not even Napoleon, can change one word that comes from the Word of God. Amen. Kaiser Wilhelm boasted, I'll build my railroad all the way from Berlin to Baghdad. And he called his men sons of destiny because he believed that God commissioned him to unite those ten toes together again. Sons of destiny. But Wilhelm was defeated on the first battle of the march because he couldn't see God standing with one foot in Germany and one foot on the continent of Europe saying, they shall not cleave one unto another. Wilhelm was sincere. He believed with all of his heart that his men were sons of destiny. He believed God wanted him to build a united Europe. He was sincere, but he was wrong. You see, you can be sincere and wrong. We need to be sincere and right. Amen? Amen. And then finally, Adolf Hitler arose out of nowhere, repudiated the Versailles Treaty, and began to build a mechanized army and air force bombing and capturing all of the surrounding countries of Germany. He said, I'll build an e empire that will last for a thousand years. And it looked as though he would. He had Norway, Denmark, Holland, Czechoslovakia, Austria, Poland. Now his appetite for conquest was whetted and, and he launched his mighty blitzkrieg against the Scandinavian countries of Belgium and France. And when he was in France, he visited Napoleon's tomb. And he scoffed at Napoleon. He said, Napoleon, you fool, I will succeed where you failed. And it looked as though Hitler would succeed because there was only one nation left and that was the tiny island of England. The German scientists were on the brink of building an atomic bomb and Dr. Werner von Braun who defected came to America later their leading scientist was building a rocket capable of delivering that atomic bomb. Now, we didn't have long-range bombers in those days. 
I was assigned to a bomb crew in the Strategic Air Command, Barksdale Air Force Base, Louisiana. And we flew B-52s. We could take off, meet up with a tanker in the air, KC-135, full of fuel, and he would offload fuel to us, and we could just keep going and going till the wings fell off the airplane. But they couldn't do that back then. Didn't have the range, the capabilities that we have now. So in order to bomb that research facility, we had to launch our bombers from England. If Hitler would have captured England, we wouldn't have been able to launch our bombers. Instead of the bombs falling on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, it would have been New York and Washington, D.C. And you know, an interesting thing, I was talking about this one night, and after the service, a man came up to me, and he said, Pastor, you are right on. I said, well, I know, but why do you think so? <laughs> he said, because I flew that bombing mission I dropped my bombs on that research facility and bombed that facility that was building an atomic bomb. Well, Hitler had driven the Allied armies clear up the coast and it looked like nothing was going to stop him once again until a dense fog settled in and the Allies were able to evacuate their forces against the English Channel, across the English Channel. And then going against everything that he'd ever written in his books when he said you should never fight a war on two fronts for some reason that even his leading generals never understood. Hitler divided his army. Kept half of them in Europe, the other half mar marching across Russia towards Moscow, slaughtering the Russians all the way. It looked as though nothing was going to stop them until the weather entered the picture once again, this time the coldest winter in over 75 years. Hitler's guns froze up, his men froze, his tanks froze, and the mighty Hitler was defeated by a snowflake? <laughs> I've been to the Soviet Union. I was there when it was still the Soviet Union doing Revelation Now meetings. And they took us on a tour out to the outskirts of Moscow and showed us this big, huge concrete tank trap. Uh, they like to make big monuments, and it was huge, reaching way up in the air. A tank trap, concrete. And they signed said, this is the very spot where the mighty Russian army stopped the Germans. But they didn't understand that it wasn't Russia. It was the Almighty God standing with one foot in Germany and one foot in Russia saying, they shall not cleave one unto another and no man can change one word that comes from the Word of God. Amen. Not even Hitler. Hitler wrote to his people, we don't need anything from God. We don't ask anything from him except that he let us alone. We want to fight our own war with our own guns without God. We want to gain our own victory without the help of God, signed Adolf Hitler. But Hitler knew the prophecies of the Bible. He knew about Daniel too. And his nurse tells the story that one day Hitler was sick, lying in bed reading, and his Bible was open to Daniel chapter 2. And when he got to the words, they shall not cleave one unto another, Hitler sprung out of bed picked up his Bible, threw it across the wall, hollering, ranting, and raving like a madman, I will, I will, I will. But today Hitler is dead. And God's word still stands. Amen. You can't change. No one can change. One word from the Word of God. In more modern times, I remember 1958, my old high school loudspeaker began to crackle and the announcement came, Russia launched a satellite, Sputnik, going around the globe, and everybody got scared. We didn't know for sure what that meant. I don't know about up here, but down in New Orleans, Louisiana, we built bomb shelters. Did you do that up here? None of you were around back then. We built bomb shelters. We thought Russia was going to bomb the world and we we're going to all be destroyed. So we built bomb shelters. We were scared. The Bible says no more. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome. Rome divided and they will not cleave one into another. There'll be no more. Two years later, 1958, Nikita Khrushchev, and I know some of you remember that, he came over here to the United Nations, took off his shoe and banged it on the desk and he said, United States of America, we will bury you. Well, the Soviet Union is history today, and the United States of America still stands. God's Word cannot change. 
Trust him. Trust him. Some people ask me, Pastor, how do you know that the Bible wasn't written? How do you know that the Bible wasn't written way back? After all of this stuff had happened, Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, and wrote it like it was a prophecy, but it wasn't really. It's just the history. No way. That's impossible. Because the way we predict the future is to look at what happened in the past. Isn't that right? We don't know the future. We just look at the past and extrapolate it into the future. I can tell you that at 8.30 tomorrow morning, my breakfast is going to be on the table and my wife will have it ready. How do I know that? Because she's done it all the time. But that doesn't prove it's going to happen. You see, we predict the future by looking into the past. So suppose that Daniel wrote this after it all happened. And he's writing Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, Rome divided as a history. That makes it even worse to the skeptic. Because we predict the future by looking at the past. He would have seen four nations rise and fall in a brief period of time, historically speaking, and then 1,600 years have passed and they have not cleaven one into another 1,600 years. How could he say no more when looking back he saw four rise and fall? You can trust the Bible. You can trust this book. And it isn't over yet. Watch this. Best part coming, verse 44, in the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed. There will be another kingdom, not a nation on earth, not by any leader, a potentate, or king. It will be the Lord God. He will set up his kingdom. In verse 44, in the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom. It will never be destroyed. It will crush all of those kingdoms and bring them to an end. But itself it will endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of the mountain that smashed the image. The great God has shown the king what will take place in the future. The dream is true. The interpretation is trustworthy. You can know the future as God reveals it to you. The stone is going to come. Who is the stone? Peter said, come to him, the living stone. The stone is Jesus Christ. Just as surely as there was Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, just as surely as Rome divided, just as surely as 1,600 years have passed and they have not joined together, you can know the stone is going to come. But what about the European Union? They've already joined together. No, they haven't. Ask a Frenchman if he's a Spaniard. They haven't joined together. Every time they come up with a document, somebody fusses and fights about it, and they can't sign it. But it's close, maybe. But what does that tell us? That tells us, folks, that we are close to the end because in the days of those kings, the stone is going to come. Jesus is coming again. We are living in the toenail time of that image. And you can trust the Word of God. Daniel saw it. John saw it in the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 21. I saw a new heaven and a new earth because the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. A new heaven, a new earth. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. And then verse 3, I heard a voice. Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be his God. Now we understand Babylon captured God's people, marched them through the desert sand, and they were wondering, where is God? Finally, God answers and says, I am here. I'm with you. I'm in the new Jerusalem, and this is your home forever. Hold on. I'm here. And then on each side of the river was the tree of life bearing 12 crops of fruit. I want to eat some of that fruit. I don't know what it is. It doesn't say. I used to think that some of them on that tree had to be Fuji apples. <laughs> but we did a revelation now in Wenatchee about three years ago right at harvest time and they brought us a brand new honey crisp. That's got to be right from the tree of life, right? 
mangoes, papaya, watermelon, sweet as honey. I can't wait to eat the fruit from the tree of life. There'll be no more hungry people. Amen. You want to live there? Doing only what you want to do, never having to do anything you don't want to do. Could you live forever like that? Oh, man, imagine the most exciting, best thing you've ever done in your life and have that kind of experience moment after moment after moment forever and never getting tired. I want to live there. These words are trustworthy and true. The things that must soon take place, behold, I am coming soon. Jesus is coming soon. In the meantime, there will be trouble. There will be strife. But hold fast, he says. I'm coming. In the meantime. 1966, I finished flight school, and before going to my assigned base, I had to go to survival training in Spokane, Washington, Fairchild Air Force Base. Part of my training, the last week or the last few days, they had us memorize a dummy mission. And then they put us in a simulated POW camp. I was in a little cubicle, four feet square, four feet tall. I couldn't even stand up in there. And they wouldn't let us lay down, and there was no light, and it was pitch dark. Every once in a while, they'd shove something through a hole in the door. They called it soup. It was awful. I was in there for three days, and they wouldn't let us out except for when they wanted to interrogate us to see if we would tell that dummy mission but before they took us to the interrogators, they put us in a box. This was a little box, about that tall, not even as broad as my shoulders. The hinge to the door was at the bottom, and it made a ramp. I had a bag over my head, and I had to walk up that ramp, duck walk in there. Couldn't quite fit. They picked up the door and forced me in and locked it shut. And the way I got in there was the way I was going to stay until I got out. I couldn't move a finger. I couldn't move anything. It was so dark. I couldn't even scratch my nose when it itched. And I don't know how long I was in that box. It seemed like forever. And the longer I was in there, the tighter it seemed to get. And the hotter I got. And the more and more the thought kept going in my mind, let me out of this box. Let me out. And the only thing that enabled me to survive was that I knew someone was going to open that door and let me out. I had hope. Sometimes life is like that. It squeezes us. And we think, let me out. Hang on. Jesus is coming again.